Hi, welcome to an episode, and I should say, I was about to say another episode of Coffee and No Code, but we've renamed it. So, and I couldn't imagine a better guest to help me with the, the rebranding of the this show, which is Coffee and Codeless. And so, welcome, John. And so, so what I wanted to give you a little background about John was it's rare for me to personally reach out to someone who created a blog on research and wrote an article. I'd like to read them. I'd like to actually comment. And But this is one where I personally reached out after reading John's article on cloud computing. And specifically, the challenges of adoption related to usage-based billing, the, the great things about usage-based billing I've seen, and then the, the things that are not so great when it comes time to planning and forecasting and budgeting and, and not worrying about a runaway uh, budget and clocks and costs as, as the CPUs tick away and storage ticks away. And I loved the insight. It was one of those insights I looked at and I said, like, I've been on that side. I remember um, at one time, you know, there was a team back in mainframe days, the MIPS, for those who are mainframe programmers and the word MIPS and usage. And and we had, we had just deployed a brand new system for Smith Barney brokerage and it was a web-based system talking to mainframe and and there was some runaway db2 query which was not indexed and the bill came to four hundred thousand for the few days we ran with <laughs> that query unperformed and so and i remember and it, it was it was still a bill and i remember the number and it was like back in the 90s so i still remember that so so it kind of resonated with me now john first if you could introduce you yourself your bio to the audience would be great Sure, and you're, you're reminded. You're reminding me of another runaway cost, which was buried in Oracle uh, contract details when they they chart. It was whichever's the bigger number between users, processes, processors, uh, whatever it was, and we built an architecture which was like 180 processes, microprocessors at the time, and we got hit with this bill, and it was like kind of it was staggering. Um, and the, our sales guy just went from Oracle, just said, I'm going to the Bahamas. I'm going to the Bahamas. But anyway, hello. So, uh, I, I'm John Collins. I, I'll follow uh, up with an example. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I, I, industry analyst, uh, VP of research at Giga. Um, um, we're uh, the kind of uh, engineering led analyst firm. So, so we evaluate rather than kind of wave our hands around. Um, and um, I think our shtick, if you like, is that. We've we've all got backgrounds in, in IT, and and some of the the people that are working with us now are like still doing it. They're they're, they're still you know um, in a network operations center by day, and then uh, writing reports for us by night. So so it's kind of uh, very much hands on uh, stuff that we're doing. And I I think when I wrote that article, I was, yeah, uh, you know, sometimes you write an article and you just go, ah, oh, that was just brilliant. I'm, I'm so, I just everything came. That was not one of those articles. It was like kind of, oh, I'm not sure. Have I got this right? Because it feels like everything that I'm trying to say, but I'm not sure if it's going to land. And sometimes you write those things and no one reads it anyway. But this one, it, it really seemed to resonate. Um, and uh, I think in part because no one else is saying that stuff. Uh, we're all talking about FinOps. Agreed. We're all talking about big stuff. But no one's saying, did we get this right? And uh, so that was my anxiety, but it, it really seems to have landed. You know, it's interesting. There's some, uh, I'm learning about some bigger contracts, even in the federal government, where, you know, on the cloud side, they're fixed priced. They moved more to, to a fixed price versus the usage-based billing, which always seems so attractive. For, I can tell you, usage-based billing for a startup like us was brilliant. It was amazing that we were able to just pay for it. And I remember looking at the bills and saying, really, 130 bucks a month we're paying for, you know, I remember I used to have to get data centers and servers and, but, but it was a great, great article. I, as I got to know more about John, I also learned the UML background. There's not many people that know what UML or what UML yeah. stands for, but it sounds like you actually put that in practice in past life. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've had, I mean, I've, I've, I don't know if you have the term over there, but I've blagged myself into so many jobs. Um, like, ah, oh, now I'm a security consultant. When I, when I started being a UML uh, trainer, I was literally three pages ahead in the manual. Uh, but two years later, I actually knew what it, you know, I knew what I was talking about. Um, and uh, I think one of the big experiences I had that's relevant to the usage-based pricing today is working in networking when it was telco based networking and it was x25 and it was all, all the different protocols uh 
that existed back then, but that was very much usage based, and no one. I that was what getting things going out of control looked back, like back in the mid nineties when there were like sockets on the wall that everyone thought had been turned yeah. off years before. And then they looked and they realized that you know, British Telecom was still billing like $500 a month for that socket that was now behind a filing cabinet. And and doing those audits was, was really quite uh, um, an epiphany moment for me to kind of go, oh my, people lit it. And ultimately I, th I think a lot of the issues I see in tech are around complexity. And that's a similar one. It's just, we think we can cope, but we can't with the amount of detail, with the amount of data, with the amount of services. Um, it just always grows beyond us. Yeah, it's interesting. So the example you gave before, which I'm not going to name the vendor, but might be similar vendor. Um, when I had left the corporate world and I sat with the global CIOs who I was peers with to say, I'm going to go create a startup, um, their only question to me was not where you'll succeed, not why you're doing it. They got those. They, they're like, we get it. The question was, how do you not become evil? And how do you not become? And and I loved that question because every day I wake up, that's the question that comes through my head. And it comes mm -hmm. down to, you know, something we've talked about, which is value. And that's the, and I look at, there, there's an example in my past life where um, database vendor came to us and said, you owe us, you know, tens of millions of dollars for this product that you've been using and, we never heard of the product and you know it turned out turned out it was turned on automatically when the servers were installed but we never used it or knew it was there and the database vendor themselves turned it on we paid them to to install the software so we didn't know it was there we didn't know but like i that was their definition of evil to me that was the like yeah like, how good. are you going to push the license yeah <laughs> and uh, so, 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 what do you think of so, so value based, and how do we measure value? How do we achieve value? What's 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 that look like in your mind? Whoa, that's an easy question to answer. Said no one ever. <laughs> um, I mean, val value is very straightforward. From a, a interestingly, we're constantly in IT talking about how you know has the CIO got a place on the on the board. Now are they have they got a seat at the table? Do they understand the language of business? And and you know, we, over the years, it's always been these kind of hybrid CIOs and you know business IT and alignment and all that stuff. Um, but we're still very engineering focused and very tech focused. And and uh, part of the complexity that we're dealing with today, and it's got a direct relevance to to the codeless stuff, um, is we're very, very good at creating things without thinking necessarily about the cost of managing them and, and, and keeping them going or whether or not anyone's going to use them and whether the business is going to get value. But the, So the definition of value should come from the business, and it's a very simple definition then because value, the value equation is value equals benefits minus costs. So what's, what, what's it delivering? How much are you spending in order to deliver that? And, and so... Value uh, benefits increase through better effectiveness. Uh, costs reduce through increased efficiency. It's if you can put everything within those terms, you're, you're winning. Um, and then the question is, why is the stuff that you're doing? Why is it so hard to characterize what you're doing in those terms? That's the problem to be solved. Um, not I, not, not what love, does value mean? You know, it's it's so different, John. So the other the other research organizations try to put technologies in boxes and they try to make you think through things in terms of architecture diagrams of what fits in a box. And, and the reality is you have to assemble lots of different boxes to make something work. And that it's difficult. It's chaotic, actually, for those involved as you, you've been involved, you know, this, that's where you're, you know, it's absolute chaos to deliver software. And the thing that I learned early on, we always used to measure, things, whether they were on time and on budget, and that's what you report to the board and to the investors and everyone is on time and budget. And then what I learned many, many years ago was we delivered this software, it was at Citigroup, and I called the business head, to your point, and I said, and I just inherited this team. And I think we spent $1.2 million building this software, which on the surface sounded really cool. It sounded like this is going to automate 
a lot of things for them and reduce cost and increase controls and all the things you want is the value, mm-hmm. the business outcome. And the business user basically looked at me after I called them up and said, congrats, we're in production. And he goes, I got to go hire a hundred people to run the system you just built. And I said, what? And he goes, there's literally, it's going to take a hundred more operations people to support the software, the way it's been designed and built. It didn't achieve the automation. It's increasing costs. So we shut it down. I wrote off the software instantly. I had mm-hmm. no issue saying, well, it's just, it, it, the tax benefit is more than the value of the software in increasing. But like that, that taught me, always ask the question, you ask the business, did it achieve the value set out? And What's most interesting was I was able to, um, my last corporate project moved that all the way up front where it was, um, it was thousands of pages of requirements documents coming from the business. And we simply made the business go through an exercise and say for every requirement, indicate how much revenue you're signing up for or how much expense you're signing up to take out. And suddenly the thousands of pages becomes hundreds of pages. And most of that disappears. Most of the, mm-hmm. because you can't get it down to what's the value. And then once you deploy it, you have to go back and measure and be able to track it. And that's, so to me, the on time and on budget, I always use the analogy. It's like going to a furniture store and saying, you know, that couch looks great. You know, I'll buy it. So I know the cost is exactly what I paid. And I know you'll deliver it tomorrow and it comes tomorrow. But it's until it gets into your apartment, you don't realize it doesn't fit. It actually is too big. And it's like you want it or need it. That's kind of the, the way I see technology. That's literally our sofa. Yep. It's, <laughs> it doesn't go with anything your... else. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I'd not thought of our sofa as a kind of in, uh, a complete uh, uh, allegorical statement on the state of the IT industry, but it is. Now, every time I sit on it, I'll think this is, this is the IT industry right here. So it's the See, that's color. it. I gave you a whole perspective. <laughs> it's good. You it gotta, does, I'll use the color next time. You're right. It's not size. It's color. It's got to be. Does it, it match? It, does it? It it just doesn't work. It but it. I, I love it. I love it. But um, love interestingly, it. And, and, yes. Uh, one of um uh, when I was working at a, a software tools company uh at an insurance firm. And I was helping them build software better. So really, uh, again, another epiphany moment in my, in my career when, um, well, two things happened. One was we, we then sat down with the ops people and said, so we're going to be deploying this in two weeks' time. Hey! And they went, well, no, you're not, because we don't have suddenly everyone stops everything in order to deploy your stuff. You know, where, where do you think this is going to come from? Uh, so there was that. But then the, the 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 ops director kind of looked at me because um, we kind of understood because I'd run infrastructure before it, and he said, "Those people out there, they've got no idea what it's like in here," and that remark has stuck with me. Of kind of you know, and it, and you go to I'm, I'm I was remembering it, so I went to a um, and this isn't a comment on the companies at all, but I went to a GitHub conference, and it's full of people so excited and keen about innovation absolutely uh, and then i went to a, a vmware conference and it's full of people that just know that things are quite hard and you've got to deal with that but the difference between the two w- was just fascinating that there isn't a link you know we talk about devops as linking that that join never happened it just enabled That's- us to develop things faster it was never the other way around that's fascinating that's the um and and getting you know it, it, I always use VMware, and I know the company from its earliest days of virtualization and then dynamic ops, and we, we deployed. At Citigroup, believe it or not, in 2006, we built a request engine called Marketplace where an engineer could say, I need five CPUs or eight CPUs for 32 gig. And we automated the provisioning and uh, gave them the box instantly within 10 minutes, you know, predecessor of cloud in many ways of what it became. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't see where it was going, but it was early on. But you could see where that was going to get to, the virtualization. I know that's a, a, great, a great pivot to codeless, which is serverless, mm-hmm. you know, virtualization that's dropped away the hardware. Codeless to us, and the reason I reached out to you was, like, I wanted to basically show you, like, there's this answer in cloud. There's some place in cloud where the usage-based billing could be created in a way to understand and predict usage based on patterns and integrations on logic and volume 
to be able to come up with that fixed price, which is what we do. And that was where this, this abstraction layer comes. I know I, you know, my views um, have been pretty strong in that, like the 20 year old technologies out there that are branding themselves low code, no code, and these legacy categories out there. And really what they're doing is generating code and their code and they're config like that's, and so like, to me, like that's the example of not VMware, but like the servers, the actual servers underneath VMware that you're being exposed to and creating and, and the points there. And I'd love like your views on like, where's, where does software get to, where do we actually land? Where's, where's that value going back to the value question? Mm -hmm. Well, I think first, really interestingly the cio has blinked uh, and what, what i mean by that is over the past 15 years everyone's been a little bit kind of uh, uh here hang on to this rope and then the rope's being pulled and you still hang on to the rope you think it's a good place to go but you, so the journey to the cloud has been kind of you don't want to let go because you think you know you'll get left behind but it, you're being pulled all the time and what's yeah. happened, uh, and we kind of saw it at the beginning. I, I actually got to review the O'Reilly FinOps book a couple of years ago um, when that was just starting to be a thing. And, and to me, it was a relatively new topic, if you like. And, and I, was, I was reading the architecture sections and kind of giving some feedback on that. But um, it was overall, I thought, yeah, this stuff has really got a place. Um, but that was just one part of this overall trend of, no, we need to be in control. I'm going to let go of this rope now because I, I want to be in charge. I, I want to be pulling. I don't want to be pulled. And we're seeing that in FinOps. We're seeing that in cloud resource management. We're seeing that uh, in the current Vogue term of cloud repatriation. Um, it, it, it's a lot of different dimensions to the, the IT decision-making strategy organization, not just the CIO, but that whole kind of group of people looking to take charge of, of their future decisions. So you end up with a hybrid multi-platform environment. And the to, to your point about uh, being able to assess cost, being able to think architecturally um, without being dragged into the places other people are trying to get you to and without having then a whopping price tag emerging at the back of it. We're seeing more and more. I, I think the the sustainability, the ESG factor is a big factor as well. Um, and uh, if I may, the conflict in U Ukraine is a big factor as well. People want, they want control back. And that's that's a major, um, it, it, it's, it's less of a trend and it's more of a kind of collective decision that it's not going to be about vendors telling us what to do anymore. It's going to be about us defining things, creating things, delivering things in the way that makes the most sense for my business. Does that, does that make sense? So that... It does. It's, it's interesting. I and mean, to me, it comes down to like the position of a technology. Like I always view myself as a technology leader sitting at the table with the business and I should be able to know where they need to go next more than they do. Like my view mm -hmm. was, I need to learn a business, understand their business to be able to advise them what are the technology investments and leaps we need to take in order to move forward. And I didn't listen as much to my own technology team as I did the strategy. And I guess the best example was, um, so, and this, this is similar to what you're saying, John. So I, I entered MetLife as a global CIO, 10,000 engineers, you know, 47 countries. And I'll never forget when I started to look at the strategy we were putting forward, our technology strategy, we're gonna lead, here's what we're gonna do. And I went to the CEO of the Americas, amazing leader. I mean, just, he's one of the best I've ever ever met. He ran 70% of the revenue i met. And went to him and I said, you know, your team isn't really engaged with us. Like we don't see the business at the table. We wanna get you excited about what we're doing and where we're going. And, and he said, let's do a quarterly meeting. I'll bring, you bring all your team, I'll bring all my team. So I organized this and the first meeting we came to the table and for three hours, we presented to all the business, our strategy and technology. Where we're... And at the end of the meeting, they looked at us and they go, we have no idea what that means. Like that, we don't understand like how that relates to what we need to deliver for the shareholders of the company and our customers. And so 
the next day or two days later, we met again for three hours and they presented purely to us their strategy, which no one had seen when I took over the group. And like the technology group was, it was such a disconnect between the two sides that we then came back and said, okay, now here's your strategy. We're going to map it to everything we're doing and anything that doesn't map, we're dropping. And let's just talk about how this works together. And mm. that was kind of the, the epiphany is how do you bring those together? The, the interesting thing for me is the, um, we see it so many times where there's strong technology leaders who say, here's where we're going to get to. Here's how, you know, codeless architecture is going to help us get there. Here's how you fit in. Here's how other vendors, but here's how our team fits in. And there's other technologists that delegate that down in their organization and say, oh, I'm going to let the decisions come at every level of the group. And, you know, the problem with that is an engineering manager of one team sees their budget. A CIO sees the company budget and understands the company expense and should understand mm -hmm. the business expense and operations and everything. And so those decisions, when they come down, a lot of times they're made with like, okay, well, I'm going to bring a code generation tool in because I could still code and it's going to let me do what I do and I'll, I'll just do it faster and generate more code. Well, the CIO comes to us and says, I want to eliminate code. And that's the results. You know, the study that we did recently, like 70% of the CIOs said, I want less code, not more of it, because it keeps mm -hmm. distracting away. That's kind of where like this breakdown and I'd love, so if CIOs step up to the table, which is what would be the best thing ever is saying, how do you support your business and, and build, you know, with the business side by side and actually driving that is, it's a great place to be. And then I think your cloud conversation takes on a new approach because it's the overall benefit of what, you know, you'd have to then bring in the time to market benefit into the solution. Mm. And how fast does that solution go versus the traditional way? All is part, it's a part of that. What do you think? Is that? I mean, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I hope I can remember what the, the, the kind of synapses that were popping as you were speaking there. So um, we've talked about uh, value uh, and the importance of kind of, almost visibility on uh, benefits, if you like. And that could be financial. It could be customer experience. It could be sustainability, whole, whole bunch of different measures. But you need measurability. But then um, what you're talking about with um, the, the code side of things is uh, actually we need two things. One is orchestration. Um, so... And these words are so overused, uh, but bear with me. So the ability to create things without building them from scratch, we need to be able to you know, pull together rather than, and the better we can do that. And then the second, uh, almost to the virtual machine point, is around abstraction. Uh, and that's it. There will always be code somewhere. It's just whether or not we are directly responsible for cre you know, solving the problems caused by creating it. Um, so... Uh, we need to be at the level of, and it's like the three layer model back in, back in the day, you know, you, at the end of the day, you want to focus on the business stuff. You don't want to be focusing on data management. And similarly, you know, there's security, all the different things that the platform should do are going to be a massive distraction. So even though you might want to be a software company, you don't want to be in the weeds of everything that's going on within that software. And I, I think that kind of partially answers the question that came up in the chat of, uh, Will there be a different approach from the way applications are built? I, I think the answer is uh, Srinivas. Is that um, it's about where you put your people. You need your people at the architecture level. You need your people at the orchestration level of you know how to pull these pieces together, and you need your people understanding. And we talk about value as a kind of communications tool. It's not a communications tool. It's is your stuff of value to your you know. Are you adding to the business model or are you taking away? That, that's not just to kind of to enable that conversation. I, boy, if we could get that as a performance review and everyone's performance review is how you actually oh, wow. contribute to the business or take away, wouldn't that be, that would be game changing, John. That would be actually like, I always like, like to me, the, like the way we assess effectiveness of technology is broken, right? It is, um, I used to have a business partner that would say, we, we never get the phase two, right? And I think we've like, we always, we always fear there's never a phase two because phase two has never mm. come before. So phase one better incorporate every single thing we could possibly imagine. 
and like like bring it all together into this one master thing and then phase one never comes <laughs> it's like and it's and we wonder why it's like we've got so so it is uh i like so abstraction we define that in code with like i love that orchestration we define you know you need a system to be the glue to bring it all together there's never going to be one whole system you know there's going to be many different pieces that are each assets to a bigger mm -hmm. solution and piece and that's and so i love that concept that is i i would agree with you completely in what you said i mean that's fully aligned and uh and is UML have a part of that? I got to go back to your day. Yeah. So, uh, like, what? Just let my, that's my last question to you. So, what? What is your most? What would be when you look back? Because again, like you have, you have practical knowledge, which um, and it sounds like your peers at Gigo Research have the exact same knowledge. Is like practical knowledge of, you know, suffering as many technologists do, you know, trying to build things with whatever's in front of them. And mm -hmm. everyone has the right idea is deliver a value. But like what, when you look back, what was the most exciting thing you could look back on? What do you think is like, what was that time in your life? Yeah. Oh boy. I mean, if you go back to the uh, UML time of my life, when I, I was actually, uh, it was enabling me to have hands-on experience with people within the business was fantastic. And, and to this day as an analyst, I mean, it's, Analysts can immediately vanish into the ivory tower if they're not tethered to the to the ground and to reality. And yeah. I love speaking to end user organizations today because almost immediately I'll be reminded of how difficult things are and why they're why they're difficult now is is a great uh, source of inspiration to me. So I, I think having that kind of real world dynamic and, and I'm trying to. So when you said what what about the UML side of things. The thing that you can get that I think should be true and isn't, and this is the root of part of the problem, is traceability. So uh, it should be put, everything, everything's a service ultimately. You should be able to sit down with Magin accounts and she says, well, this is what I need to do in order to do my job. I need the technology to provide that to me as a facility and you know, service. Uh, but then that goes all the way down. You know, it's turtles all the way down. So so um, that should link all the way through to uh, developers' uh, creativity, through to a cloud platform, uh, through to open source uh, capabilities. And it should be done in the right way, securely with governance and, and so on and so forth with data management. It's, it should all be traceable. And the fact that it isn't, is directly responsible to me for our massive inefficiency and our inability to keep control of the complexity because we 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 don't value that that traceability and and uml gave you that with sequence diagrams and class diagrams and, and so on uh it wasn't that they're good diagrams i mean they're okay they you know they they did the job it was the the traceability that you could have through the models that, that we've lost now I, um, you know, it's interesting. The data would say it's costing more to build the same software today than it did in 2000. Like for the first time with all mm. the strategies we've done with microservices and all the, all the things that the Git labs that you mentioned and the virtualization that came and the reality is it's costing more for the first time to build the same app than it did before. And I, you know, part of that, I used to sit next to the traders to build trading systems. Like that was the days where the server was under your desk and, there was a, to your point, traceability was you were sitting there and you see and you could understand and you could feel. And as a function and a service becomes big and the technology becomes diverse and it's it's interesting to see how do you keep that. You're right. It doesn't exist today. It doesn't exist. If You know, that's that's the, uh, what is it, the Kennedy example where uh, he asked the janitor, what are you doing? You know, what, what's your, and he's I'm sending a man to the moon and that was the, I think it's the ultimate example of traceability of everyone's, you know, aligned to the same goal. Absolutely, yep. Is yep. a is an amazing place to be. So, so John, I know we could keep going for hours. This is like, and we could do this over a drink next time. I know, I know you're. It's five thirty there, so you've got your beer. I'm hoping ready to go, and I've got my coffee to keep me going. So, this was such a, a fun fun event, and I appreciate you joining, John, and coffee and codeless. And I I look forward to talking to you soon, John. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank okay, you. Cheers. Take care. Bye bye.